All right. Well, this is Dr. Martin uh, recording uh, the lecture for today, um, the 3rd of December. Uh, it's a little bit late because I did a live session, but nobody showed up. So uh, it might have been my fault. I was about fire about seven or eight minutes late starting. Uh, and I guess I didn't send out last minute reminders. Um, so, um, well, anyway. So that's the deal on that. Um, so I have I have basically done the review for this final, but I'll do it again uh, at this point. Uh, but here's the here's the syllabus. So you can see on the syllabus, we uh, we are the last day of school, December third, and the final is, is going to be on the eighth. Now it says not one to two fifty, but I'm not going to you I'm going to give you all day to work on it. I'll start it at eight a.m. and I'll cut it off at uh, midnight. So you can start it anywhere between 8 a.m. and midnight. Now, if somebody's actually working from 8 a.m. to midnight, which I, probably is illegal, but if you're allowed to do that and you actually are scheduled to work and you can't get out of it, or you can't come a couple hours late or leave two hours early because so you can take your final exam for one of your core courses in your college experience, uh, if your employer is that hardcore, send me an email. And uh, we'll work out another time. I know some of you have other finals that same day, but uh, you can you can take them in the morning. You can take this that night. Uh, so anyway, so I guess I think I'd like everybody to take it this day, though. I, I'm willing to move it to any day, but that's the day that's published. Um, and so that's the day that y nobody can really complain about. Um, where if I move it, uh, then somebody can complain and you know so but if if I get enough people saying no 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 we really want to move it earlier a different day then fine I'll do it but I don't want to hear a bunch of complaints from somebody that's disgruntled because it's not on the day it was on the schedule all right well anyway that having been said let me uh, go forward here and um, so I'm gonna yeah I'm I'm gonna I, I I think I'm just going to show me because uh, I, I'm i going to pull up the test and look at the test questions and that that will help me to uh, that'll help me to kind of make sure I cover the material but I think I have been through it well let's see um, yeah so sorry what am I it's Pluto it is the right thing. Okay, there we are. Thirty-four sixty-three. Okay. Well, oh, not that. I don't want that. I want. Uh, don't want this either. I actually want. Hmm. <laughs> Why am I having trouble? Okay, here we go. Okay. Okay, and then... All right, so um, so yeah, so I, okay, so I think maybe one of the things I might do is, is go through some of the module stuff. I'm only going to ask you about some of the modules, so I think I'll do that. I haven't really specifically do that done that, and I'll, I'll show you the I'll show you these things because these are different than what I'm actually going to do. I, I swear. What in the world? Why is this? Why won't this shrink down? I don't know. I was ringing the doorbell. Okay, so continuing. So I'm just going to go through the modules. I, I'll probably talk about all of them, but um, only really the ones you use in lab and a, a couple of others will actually be included so 
Um, yeah. All right, A to D conversion. So, how many bits of resolution is a A to D on the eighteen twenty nine? Well, it's ten bits. Um, method. So it uses successive approximation, and you remember how that works. And it starts with the highest bit first, and it sets that. That uses a comparator, compares the uh, the the digital to analog conversion value out of the SAR and compares it to the actually actual sample voltage on the input pin. And if it's higher, it clears that higher order bit and sets the next bit in line. If it's lower, it leaves that bit set and then sets the next bit in line and does another comparison. And if that comparison is higher, it clears that bit and goes to the next. If it's lower, it leaves that bit set and goes to the next. And after it goes through every single bit, taking, taking uh, you know, 10 steps, you finally get to the last bit and it leaves it set or clear depending on whether it's higher or lower and uh, and that's your plus or minus 10 bits plus or minus one bit uh, conversion so that works pretty well um, okay how many A to D inputs are available there are 12 of them on, on this chip so you have power ground and you have master clear so there's 17 GPIO pins now we're using two of them for the uh, for the snap, so we can debug code and stuff. But you you could theoretically use those. So you have 17 pins you could use. Of those, five of them do not have an analog function, and and 12 do. And those are the 12 analog pins, which also happens to include A0 and A1. But since we're using those, you really only have 10 channels. Um, it, if you have a 10-bit result. Uh, in the high and low bytes, how many bits of, of the result are in the high register if you use write justification? Well, if you write justify it, there's only then you, you have eight bits in the lower register and the upper two bits in the high register. If you use uh, if you use uh, VDD as your high voltage reference and ground as your low voltage reference, then what would your A to D result be? Uh, if your analog signal is very close to VDD? And the answer is, it's, it's going to be the maximum value of your 10 bits, which would be 11111111111 or 3FF, which is 1024. The conversion process starts with the least significant bit and works towards the most significant bit. Nope, the other way around. How many simultaneous conversions does the pick do? Well, theor at a strictly... Um, theoretical level it only has one successive approximation converter module so it can only do one conversion at a time but because it has an analog multiplexer it can do it can convert one channel switch the next convert that switch the next convert that and then you can you can theoretically do 12 conversions and go back and start over the first but obviously it does decrease the your maximum bandwidth for any one of the channels because you're you're taking away some of your time um, so, uh, so when you do those when you do those conversions, uh, when you do more than one channel, then your maximum bandwidth is decreased. Usually, when we're doing when we're doing analog to digital conversions with this chip, we're really not trying to do uh, um, high frequency signal processing because it's not made for that. Um, I just took a look at a chip, um, a new product that Mauser has from Advanced Micro Devices. And uh, uh, this chip is amazing. It has four channels of D to A and two A to D channels. And these channels can run, the, the D to A can do four gigabits per second. And the A to D can do, uh, no, I take that back. Yeah, four, I think it's, maybe, maybe the D to A can do eight gigabits per second and the, a, a, the D to A can do eight, and the A to D can do four or six, rather. Yeah, six. So it can it can operate at uh, it can take signals in the in the bandwidth of 24 gigahertz. And it the chi chip is used for phase radars and for fancy communication between uh, for for um, for fifth gen type uh, signal stuff. So it's a pretty amazing chip. It also cost uh, the chip itself cost uh, 
about two thousand dollars just for the chip um, but that's that's kicking so if you want to do if you want to do high frequency stuff you have to you you have to buy dedicated chips imagine two thousand dollar chip but 24 gigabits 24 gigahertz is very fast this chip can maybe do two kilohertz so uh, maybe a little more that's probably about it and the and it doesn't have uh, you know it only has 10 bits I think the one I just talked about has 12 bits so it's it can scream but it's also a two thousand dollar chip just the chip the evaluation board is three thousand dollars and they're they're gonna have four of them uh, in December to sell <laughs> that's it no more so get in line if you've got three thousand um, dollars pretty amazing but the stuff they're coming out with these days is just unbelievable you can have your own phased radar uh, phased array radar uh, with you know with something the size of a shoebox uh, I mean it's pretty incredible um, yeah I don't know uh, it's, it's it's hard to even imagine what this is going to look like in 10 years because those chips will get cheaper and um, I mean your car is going to have better radar systems now than cruise ships do in about 15 years or 20 years or, or maybe maybe not quite as good as the military but unbelievable all right um, so so it can do once it can do one conversion but it it can it can scan through 12 channels now our chip you have to use uh, you have to do that in software but in uh, chips in the same family and many other chips that are more advanced uh, they will scan automatically the KL 25 Z will scan automatically in fact it'll 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 do uh, up to 30 conversions average them report that value and then go to the next channel do 30 conversions average them and then go to the next channel and you can set up uh, an arbitrary list of channels and it'll scan through those and then come back around and do it again and do it again and do it again and it will move the data into memory automatically if you set all that up correctly pretty amazing um, all right about how many clock cycles does it take uh, when we use an FOS divided by four so it, it needs about a one megahertz clock it, it, it two megahertz clock is a little too fast so it needs about a one megahertz clock and if you go a lot slower than that you're you're wasting its ability to actually do the conversion you don't want to go too slow because then the sampling capacitor can bleed off a little bit so so you do want to you do want to probably do it in at, at you want to run the you want to run the, the clock for the A to D converter something close to a megahertz. So we use divide by four since our uh, since our F, since our FOS is uh, four megahertz typically. I mean you don't have to do that. We could you could set it at whatever you want. But anyway, so it takes about 13 clock cycles of the conversion clock to to do a conversion. Uh, okay, now what if you have an analog signal? That, that goes below zero because you know that you can never go below ground or VDD above VDD so VSS is the floor VDD is the height now uh, some people use ground to the fixed voltage reference and if you're running at 5 volts you could set that at 4098 or 4096 rather uh, 4.096 volts or you could use if you're running at 3.3 volts you could set it at, at 2.048 volts and the reason you do that is because it makes the makes each bit on your 10 bit value uh, uh, equal to you know 0, 0, 0, 0.004 or 0, 0.002 or whatever um, millivolts and and that's that makes it a little cleaner if you don't do that then you then you get you know you get a, a, a non-terminating fractional proportion that makes your calculations a little more complicated but it's not that bad since you're if you're do, doing it in c it's no big deal really but what can, what would you do if your signal is minus 5 volts to plus 5 volts? And you're, say, you're running your chip at 3.3 volts. What are you going to do? Well, you're going to go get an op amp, and you're going to shift. You're going to you're going to attenuate the signal from minus 5 to plus 5, which is a 10-volt range. You're going to attenuate the peak-to-peak -peak range to something like uh, no more than, you know, uh, say 3 volts or 3.1 or 3.2 volts so it doesn't exceed 3.3 and then you're going to DC shift it so your midpoint 
is such that the entire swing lies between 0 and 3.3. And a single, a single operational amplifier make, is very easy to attenuate and to DC shift. And you can set that up by just choosing the right value uh, resistors and, uh, and then hooking it up to the right inputs and boom, away it goes. Okay, that's A to D. PWM. So when we deal with PWM, we deal with duty cycle, pulse period, there is an output voltage, and obviously the inverse of pulse period is pulse frequency. Um, so the maximum voltage output of the module is generally limited by VDD. Yes, that's right. Your microprocessor is running at 5 volts, then your PWM pins can't put out more than, it's going to put out 5 volts. Uh, it's going to run at VDD. It's either going to be 0 or VDD. And uh, so if your device needs a higher voltage for its operating voltage, then you're going to have to use uh, you're going to have to use a FED or a BJT or, or you know, some other switching transistor to uh, switch the higher voltage. <coughs> or maybe even an H-bridge, depending, which, uh, which just basically has four switching transistors in it. All right, so um, the, uh, sometimes when we have a motor or some device like an LED and we want to change the brightness, Will vary, will vary the voltage. And in the old days, they used to they get a, a big power resistor for like a motor uh, that could handle a number of amps, and they would just uh, they would just uh, increase the resistance. The motor would the, some of the voltage would drop across the resistor, and the rest would go to the motor. And but that voltage drop across the resistor at a number of amps would generate a fair amount of heat. And so these uh these variable resistors were called rheostats, and they were they, they were usually big, uh, heavy wire coils wound on um, uh, with a certain amount of resistance in them, uh, like nichrome wire or that kind of thing, and they were wound on a ceramic form so that they could get pretty hot, and and the heat would be dissipated into the atmosphere, and uh, that's how they used to control motors, uh, at least to some degree. There were, there are other ways too. Uh, but uh, anyway, that was one way they did it, not a very efficient way because a tremendous amount of power is wasted. But the other problem with it is when you have, when the motor is at low power or when the voltage is fairly low and, the volt, and you want your motor to turn real slow, but you want it to have good torque, well, torque is proportional to voltage. So if you're controlling it with the voltage and you drop the voltage, you're dropping the torque. And then when you get to these slow rotational speeds, the motor will stall and it certainly wouldn't be very powerful. So like if you're used to having a, 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 a little screwdriver, you know, a little handheld battery powered screwdriver, uh, you know those things are still very powerful even at low torque. How do they do that? Well, they do it with PWM. You're still running, you're, when the voltage is on in the PWM cycle, it's still at full power voltage for that device. Like if you're running at 18 volts or 24 volts, it's still 24 volts. Um, but you only have it on for a fraction of the duty cycle, so, uh, so or, or a fraction of the pulse period. So your so your duty cycle is maybe you know at very slow RPM is maybe you know one percent or two percent of the pulse period. We normally talk about duty cycle in percentage because it's the proportion of the pulse period where the output is at at the high voltage versus the total pulse period. So it's basically a ratio, and that's why we call it a percent. So we just make it a ratio between 0 and 100. All right. Um, so the timer associated with a given channel uh, counts up to, say, 0, 8F, and then resets and starts over. What part of the PWM signal does this represent? This, so uh, not a great question, but anyway, this is basically the pulse period. So normally we set that to FF in our 8-bit timer because we want the maximum pulse period to give us the best uh, uh, the best resolution on our on our duty cycle. If you use a small period, you only the typically basically you can get 10 bits, but it's a little bit of a fiddle the way that works uh, because it uses it takes FOS divided by four and then it uses the actual FOS frequency, so it counts those four cycles. For, for you know for each uh, instruction clock as the uh, other two bits so you really just get eight bits in your register and then the other two bits 
are in the middle of uh, one of the control registers and the timer is only an 8-bit timer so the other two bits that it's comparing with are, are the uh, FOS divided by 4 those those two bits that take your your 4 megahertz clock and you get 4 ticks of the 4 megahertz clock for every one tick of the FOS divided by 4 so that's how it that's basically how it how it gets 10 10 10 bits so if you're just using the 8 bits in the in the uh, in the in the in the duty cycle register which is CCP X L um, that that register only has eight bits in it. So if you're using that, and you you're you're not counting all the way up to FF in your in your timer, then you you don't even have eight eight bits, uh, much less ten. So you won't have a lot of precision on your ability to control your duty cycle. All right. So the tracing below is being generated by your PWM of two cycles. What is the approximate duty cycle? All right, so I even marked it off. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So this is one fourth of the pulse period. The pulse period is this length of this arrow from the start of one pulse to the start of the next pulse. And this pulse is up for 25% of the duty cycle and then for another one, two, three, 25% it's down to zero again. So this is 25% duty cycle. 75% of the time it's off, 25% of the time it's on, each pulse period. And then this pulse period could be, so you have what's called, um, I didn't put it up here, but the, well, yeah. So, so the pulse frequency, which is just the inverse of the pulse period, but that tells you how fast this repeats, right? So the pulse period is how long it is, and then if you invert that, you get the frequency, which is how how many how 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 often you're doing these pulses. And for for a lot of things, like for LEDs, well, we want this we want the this frequent we want this to, this pulse period to be short enough that we can that, that the frequency is high enough that we're not seeing it flash. So we want it, you know, probably something like a thousand cycles per second would would be a nice fused image with no blinking at all. Uh, if you get down near 100, you might perceive a little flashing, and certainly at below 60, you probably will see it. Uh, and certainly below 30, you absolutely will see it. Um, so so you, you want it up. But if you get it too fast, then then the if you're, say, driving LEDs, your LED might not be able to fully turn off. And as a result, uh, you'll... you'll you won't be able to really control the brightness like you want to because it's never fully turning off or it's maybe never fully turning on so uh, so usually it's a turn on problem I mean a turn off problem not a turn on problem um, so you so there is a maximum frequency when you're controlling LEDs same with motors now obviously uh, motors are mechanical devices and the way we control motors they 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 have they they're moving parts with a certain amount, a fair amount of weight to them, and a lot of inductive kickback. So you have to con you have to choose your 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 pulse repetition frequency uh, pretty carefully there. Um, and there's a there's a range where you really want to operate. And and the other thing that's interesting is because of because of noise, uh, a lot of times the windings in these motors uh, will will uh, will vibrate a little bit. And if you run it, say at, at two kilohertz, uh, you'll you'll probably hear a kil two kilohertz tone, and it might even be loud enough to be irritating. Uh, so sometimes you have to you have to adjust your frequency to try and uh, avoid a really unpleasant uh, noise from the thing you're controlling. That can even be true of heater coils. So you you do have to think about a number of factors when you pick these values. On our chip, we're kind of we're, we're kind of we, we have some range that we can adjust these, uh, but it, they do have an interplay with the processor clock. And uh, so one of the reasons we tend to use the 4 megahertz clock is because it kind of works okay uh, over the, most of the range of, that were of interest for these things. But, uh, but if you wanted to go really fast, you'd have to up your processor clock. If you want to go really slow, you'd have to lower it a little bit. Okay. Um, so... 
what, what value is represented by the arrow in the figure? The arrow represents the pulse repetition interval, or the pulse period, or the pulse frequency, however you want to describe it. The reason we use PWM to change the brightness in LED is because it's a very non-linear, uh, the LED has a very non-linear change in luminance with voltage applied. LEDs all need different dry voltages. LEDs are very linear with respect to dry voltage. So the answer is they're very non-linear with respect to dry voltage. So you, so it's better to run them at, at a voltage that puts them in their operating, you know, in the in the sweet part part of their operating range, where they don't generate much heat, but they have almost full brightness. If you keep going up on the voltage, they won't get a whole lot brighter, but they will they will start generating more heat. So that's why you don't want to do that. It's because you're wasting power. Uh, so. So we, when we do it with PWM, we can pick the drive voltage, and then we can still vary the, the luminance by the percent of the by the duty cycle. If we have 100% duty cycle, there'll be there'll be maximum brightness. If we have no duty cycle, there'll be minimum, and it's pretty linear in those ranges because we're we're changing the amount of power we're delivering. We're not changing the voltage, and they're non-linear for voltage. So. One advantage of PWM for controlling power delivered to a vice over a variable resistor, like a rheostat, is that very little power is being wasted in the PWM process. That's right. When we're in this part of the cycle, no power is flowing. So we're not wasting any. And, and, we're, not, and we're certainly not wasting any in a big resistor trying to control the voltage. Okay, and then finally, getting a DC motor to run very slowly is always possible with a vari variable resistor. No, it'll stall out. Uh, you can get it to run a whole lot slower with PWM than you could ever with a variable resistor and with a lot more torque. Uh, with a variable resistor uh, or variable voltage, however you want to vary the voltage, you could do it with a transformer too, I guess, uh, which would not waste as much power. But in any event, if you use if you use that method, you'll get to the point where the motor's torque will be very minimal, and it, and if you try and drive any kind of load, it'll just stall out, and then the motor will sit there and just get hot. So that's not a good solution. Okay, real time clock. We didn't really talk about this, um, so I, I don't think I'll go over this. No, I don't think you know, but you can definitely take a, a real time clock. They come with their own little battery charger and battery backup so that they hold the time. Once you, once you set the time, they, they just keep on going. They have, they have a crystal oscillator usually as part of this, so they're pretty accurate. And uh, then they have that crystal oscillator trimmed so that it is accurate. And they'll just sit there and crank away. And they're, they have, uh, they're on a 400-year cycle thing where they know about uh, leap years, and I think they even know about even centuries divided by four. So like the, the century 2020, uh, 20,000, uh, which now is 20 years, 21 years ago almost, uh, that should have been a leap year, but it wasn't because of the, the, the rule that even centuries divided by four are not leap years. But otherwise, pretty much all centuries would be, all, all the other centuries would be. So when we... You know, when we get to 2,100, uh, that will be a leap year. Okay. So that, that's only a problem every 400 years. Yeah. So we have a ways to go for that, right? <laughs> All right. So we're not going to talk about that. Um, interrupts. So you did use interrupts. Some of you have used them for your projects, which is very cool. Interrupts are very powerful devices, and you should definitely not be intimidated by interrupts. They are your friend, and they can definitely make your life so much easier uh, in a number of circumstances that you could just never, never get the application done without interrupts. And and in a more advanced chip, uh, well, even on the PIC, you could have several different things causing interrupts. Uh, it, it, the, the PIC has lots of different interrupt sources. 
Uh, we only used one at a time, but you can have multiple ones enabled. Just remember, when you finish one interrupt, you have to you have to check to see that which flag. If you're using like three interrupts, then you have to look at all three interrupt flags and see which one was set to cause the interrupt, and then service that device, and then return. And then in the meantime, one of the other ones may have set its flag, which means you would immediately re-interrupt once you return from the first interrupt and then you'd service the second one. But you'd only know that if you go out and check the flags again. And you also al almost always have to clear the flags manually. Uh, so in the interrupt service routine you generally should clear, you generally have to clear the interrupt flags. Um, okay, so um, what interrupts can occur when the GIE, GIE bit is cleared? None. Will the interrupt flag bit still get set even if the corresponding interrupt enable bit is, is cleared? In other words, you're not actually going to cause an interrupt, but will the interrupt flag still work? Yes, the interrupt flag gets set anyway when you hit the whatever condition, like a timer. When the timer overflows, it sets its flag. There may not be an interrupt enabled, that's fine, it won't cause an interrupt, but it will set that flag. And, when, and we have used that to check to see if the timer overflowed, even though we weren't using it uh, in the first timer lab, I think this was lab two, we, we, that's what, exactly what we did. We did not enable interrupts. We used the timer flag. When it, over, when it overflowed, that's when we returned from our delay routine. Then in the next lab, we actually used it as an interrupt. Um, so we, then we did set the interrupt enable bit and the GIE bit, and sometimes you have to set the peripheral interrupt enable bit as well. When you set all that stuff up, then it actually causes an interrupt and you go to an interrupt service routine. Um, on the PIC, uh, what ports can be used for external interrupts? So, um, the, the interrupt on change, I believe, only applies to A and B. Let me take one second and check that. So here you see the, the port A pins can be Conf op configured operators interrupt and change, and so can the port B pins, uh, but not the, uh, but not, uh, none, none of the port C pins can be. That's just how they set it up. Okay. Let's see where is it. Okay. Um, all right. And then, what's the difference between the INT interrupt pin that happens to be on RE2? and the interrupt on change interrupt pins? And the answer is the, the INT pin was a legacy pin. Even some of the very, very earliest uh, and fairly simple pick parts had an INT interrupt, so you had one external pin that could be used as an external interrupt. Uh, and then they realized, gee, that's really not enough. We need to have uh, more p capability. So that's when they came up with the IOC module and they incorporated that. And then and then after that, that's when really pretty much everything else goes through the peripheral interrupt enable register. So, so some of the legacy devices, notably timer zero, the int pin, and the interrupt on change pins, uh, have flags in the uh, in the int con register, and um, don't really aren't, don't conform to the standard, which is to have your interrupt enable bit in the PIE and your interrupt flag in the uh, the uh, PIR and there's like PIEs 1, PIE 2, PIE 3, PIE 4 I think there's four different PIEs on this chip and more on other chips the newer chips most most of the non almost all the non legacy devices well they all they all conform to this uh, peripheral interrupt register stuff uh, but some of these legacy things like the int pin didn't so RA2 can actually generate an interrupt directly using the int function or the interrupt on change function. And uh, you actually guess you could, I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure, there's no way, yeah, I don't know how you would, I don't know what advantage that would be. All right, what is the interrupt, what is an interrupt vector? An interrupt vector comes into play when you have a chip that, that has a table that each interrupt can be assigned a particular address to go to for its ISR, and uh, and and the KL25Z does have this. Obviously, the our, our chip does not. 
Um, everything goes to location four on our chip. Uh, what is the ballpark number of things that can cause interrupts on the pick? Lots. There's way more than six things. I mean, just in pins, uh, pretty much the A pins and the B pins, so that's 10 right there. Uh, and, and then almost every single module, uh, all the timers, the A to D, the D to A, the comparator, uh, the PWM modules, all that stuff, er everything pretty much ha can generate an interrupt. An interrupt handler should check to verify what caused the interrupt. Yes, yeah, it's really good practice. Even if you've only enabled one interrupt, you should still probably do that um, just in the case there's not some kind of uh, mistake in the software or something. Um, when you service the interrupt, what would happen if the routine does not clear the interrupt flag for that device? You would immediately re-interrupt. You would never get out of the interrupt. As soon as you returned, you'd immediately interrupt again. Um, an interrupt handler should save any registers used if not done in hardware. No, you don't have to save any registers used uh, because they're, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, this is a bad question. Well, if you, if, you, if, you use, if you use some registers that other parts of the program might be using, then yes, you should definitely do this, but, but pretty much all the critical registers are, are saved in what are called shadow registers and the hardware actually saves them and when you return from the interrupt restores them and it does it for like the W, the BSR, the PCL, the PC latch high uh, uh, there's a bunch of them. The program counter itself is stored on the stack and it's restored from the stack because of course it's a 15-bit register. I think the indirect registers are also saved um, so I think and uh, it, it says what's saved. I guess we could I guess we could pull up the data sheet just to see for sure. Um, that's going to be in, in here. So contact automatic contact saving. So let's look at that. See if we can see where that talks about. So upon entering and interrupt, the return program address, program counter address, is saved in the stack. Additionally, the following registers are automatically saved in shadow registers: the W status, but it doesn't save the TO and the PD bits. BSR. FSR and P latch. Okay, so it, it, it doesn't save the indirect registers. Yeah, and these registers are actually available in bank 31, so you can read them and write them if you want. Uh, so I guess I guess if you use yeah, the FSR registers, sorry, that's that's the that's the indirect registers. Yeah, they are saved. So that's what's saved. So that and that that makes sense. The the yeah. So so really any register you'd use uh, is saved. If you use a random access location, obviously that's not going to be saved. All right. All right. I think we're going to good. Generally the user has to write the interrupt service routine. Yes. That's right. LCD display all right, here are the pins. There are 14 pins. And uh, on this test, I didn't label them all. So there's ground power. There's the contrast pin that you have to put a pot on, and you have to turn that to get the, uh, the contrast just right so you can see it the best. And it can, be con it can be adjusted so you can't see it at all. So you have to be careful with that. Then you have the register select pin, the read write pin, the E pin, which is basically the clock, and then you have data 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Now, when you run it in 4-bit mode, you're using data 4, 5, 6, and 7. You're not, you don't use the lower 4 bits. These should, these should have, these should have pull-up resistors on them because if you, uh, if you switch, put it in output mode, in read mode, then these will get driven and you don't want to, you wouldn't want to ground them and then have them be driven to ones and, and basically have a short circuit, which, which it probably would survive, but it's just not a good idea. Uh, so your six pin minimum connection, what does that involve? So six pins, we don't count, don't count power and ground. Contrast, you don't control that with the uh, micro, you just, you just have a little pot. So the pins you need is, you need the, you need the read, you don't need the read write pin because you're, you you generally are always going to write. The only reason for reading is to uh, 
is to check the busy bit, which you don't really have to do. You can just do a fixed delay. So, so you can, so you do have to have the the RS pin controlled. You do have to have the E pin controlled. You have to set this to to, to ground so that you're always writing. And then you need the four high data, data bits, data four, five, six, and seven. So, RS E data four, five, six, seven. Those are the, that's the six pin interface. If you do an eight pin interface, then you then you need RS and E and eight data pins. And then if you want to include the read write pin so you can read the busy bit, then great. Now you've got now you've got an eleven pin interface. But that's a lot of pins to use on a micro where you've only got well, you really don't even have you you, you really don't even have seventeen pins. You've only got uh, you've only got fifteen pins to start with. So if you use eleven of them for your LCD display, that really limits what you can do. And that's also why why we used the I squared C interface, uh, so that you only had to use two pins. And not only that, but you could use those for other I squared C devices too. All right, in four bit mode, which four data lines? It's the high four. All the commands to display take the exact same amount of time to execute. True or false? No, that's false. A couple of the commands, the the clear display goes out and writes uh, a space bit in every single location that's displayed, and it takes it almost two, uh, yeah, I think it takes us almost two milliseconds, whereas most of the time it happens at about 40 nanoseconds. So it's, so it's pretty fast most of the time, but a few of the commands are particularly long commands. What is the simplest thing you can do with the contrast pin? If you just ground it, you will get some kind of display. It it's, may not be perfect. Uh, so if you really want to control it and make it nice, you do have to have a pop. Data command data and commands are written on a display on the edge of the read white pin. No, on the edge of the E pin. When the display powers up, it's in the off state or on state. It is in the off state. Powers up in off mode. Remember we talked about that. And you first have to issue a command to turn it on, to set the cursor, and to put it in four bit mode. What pin is used to tell the LCD display whether the next data bits uh, are text or a command? And that's the RS, register select line, the RS line. Not the RW, not the E, but the RS. In general, we only want to read the display to see what uh, character was just displayed. N yeah, no. We, why would we do that? We're, we just wrote that character out there. There it is. All right. Temperature sensor. So we we use the MC. Uh, I I need to probably update this, but we use the we use the MCP uh, ninety seven hundred, and uh, it puts out a voltage proportional to the temperature. And if you're if you're running with an eight bit A to D, not ten bits, and on a I forget it. Three point three. Uh, I don't know. I have to look. I think if you're running it, I don't know. I, I have to go to the data sheet. I, it's it is a little tricky to get the stupid things calibrated. You have to you have to play around with that a little bit. But there's a there is a relatively straightforward conversion from voltage to temperature. All right. Some sensors are pre-calibrated and some have to be calibrated. That's right. The the MCP ninety seven hundred is pre-calibrated. Your internal temperature sensor on your uh, pick die. That has to be calibrated. How does the temperature data get into digital format? You use an A to D converter on your chip. Is the relationship between temp and voltage linear or exponential in most sensors? It's linear in most, and uh, that's how they're set up. Sensors most commonly work by measuring the voltage drop across one or more PN junction. That's that's how your internal temperature sensor works. I don't know if that's how the external one works or not. Uh, it might use that, and then they have some kind of calibration method. I don't know. Uh, the data sheet says, and I've read it, but I just don't remember. Some sensors calibrated in Fahrenheit and some in Celsius. Yeah, if you use the LM34 and the LM35, one of those is, sens is centigrade and one of those is Fahrenheit. Um, some sensors are calibrated to go down close to absolute ca to zero Kelvin, and some just to zero centigrade. Yeah, that's right. If they're going to be used primarily inside a building, they might they might only go down to zero centigrade. But if you're using, there's some that are for more scientific purposes or whatever, and they, they may go 
they, they may go very close to, Calvin, to zero Kelvin. Which sensor would be cheapest to use with the PIC? The PIC's internal or an external? Well, obviously, the internal comes with the PIC. It's, it's free. For the above three sensors listed, what module must be used to input the reading? A to D. Using the internal temp sensor in the PIC does not require any calibration. No, it does. GPIO. So we all use some GPIO pins. So we'll talk about this. What are, what are the approximate limits on source and sync current capability for a GPIO pin? It's 25 milliamp source, 25 milliamp sync. Is there any way to tell a GP, if a GPIO pin is shorted to ground on output? Yeah, if, you, if you're out trying to output a one and you think maybe it's shorted, all you have to do is read the port with the, with, you know, port a, uh, RA1 equals, well, yeah, uh, you read, read the port. And so uh, set your variable equal to port A and then check the pin. And if you're outputting a one but it's reading a zero, it's shorted. Because you're actually gonna read the real value on the pin. Specify for the pick what hex value you would put in Tris B to make pin four and six for port B inputs and the rest uh, five and seven outputs. So port B has four pins, uh, four, five, six, and seven. So if you want four and six to be uh, uh, to be inputs, you want ones there. And if you want five and seven to be outputs, you want zeros. So you would put zero, one, zero, one, or five, uh, zero x five hex uh, you put zero x five zero because you want you're only interested in the upper four bits not the lower four so you your second hex digit would be zero if you only put in one hex digit it's going to apply to the lower four bits which aren't even implemented so it's going to do nothing can you see can you use a GPIO uh, port to do uh, PWM by doing the timing in your code yes you absolutely can do that uh, it means that's all your processor is going to be doing. Whereas the, the advantage of the module is once you set it, the module then continues to function at exactly the values you set. And you can change the registers and change the values anytime you want. But meanwhile, you can be doing other things like reading in a potentiometer and using that to set the PWM or other things. But if you're bit banging it, you, you might have to use like an interrupt routine to bit bang it or something like that, which you could do. Uh, that would be fine. And then you could do other things. But if you do it in mainline code, you're going to be stuck with very little flexibility. Okay. All right. So let's see. So um, notice here, here's VCC, here's ground, and here's your switch. If you want to switch, to read one, then you then you have to tie the switch to VCC, and you have to gr and you have to use a resistor to pull down the micro pin. If you wanted to read the other way, you use a resistor to pull it up to VCC, and you tie the switch to the ground. So when the switch is closed, it grounds the pin. When it's open, the resistor pulls it up to VCC. And we usually use about 10k for the resistor, just so when the switch is closed, we don't draw much current. Can you, could you tie two pins together to increase current source capability? Yeah, I mean, you could in theory, right? Uh, I've, uh, I typically haven't done that, but I, I'm, sure it would be, it's, I'm sure it's doable. <clears throat> but at some point, you begin to get close to the limit on the whole chip because the chip can only do about 80 milliamps. So if you, you tie three pins and you did 25 milliamps each, you're already up to 75, and the chip's probably going to use at least some of that. On the PIC, do you use the same instructions for GPIO pin writes and reads as you do for RAM writes and reads? In other words, is this I.O. memory mapped? Yes, it is a memory mapped chip. Does the GPIO pin on the PIC have the ability to turn on internal pull-up resistors? Yeah, you do, but they're, they're not very strong. They're called weak pull-ups. They're, all they're really good for is uh, turning them on on pins that are disconnected and not used in your project. So you don't get... Uh, you don't get Funny, funny voltage surges on those pins because of static electricity effects. On the PIC, there's a difference between reading port X and reading latch X. Yes. When you read the latch, you read the relay. Uh, sorry, you read the, the, the flip-flop. When you read the port, you read what's actually on the pin.
then if you're using it as an output, they ought to be the same, but they wouldn't. That they might not be if the pin's shorted. Um, okay, I two C bus. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, okay. So what kind of outputs are used on the interface? We use open collector. Two lines, S SDA and SCL, and they use open collectors, and they do that so that all the various devices on the bus can uh, none of them drive it with a voltage. All they do is is stop pulling it down. So normally you're sitting there and, and everything's connected and, and they have their open collector outputs so that they're so that, that so that transistor is off and the and the output is floating. And then you have pull up resistors on the line. They're required. You have to have them someplace and we have them on the Viva board but some some actual uh, External devices have built-in pull-up resistors too, so you do have to read the data sheet and make sure uh, if they have pull-ups, then you might want to take the ones off the board so you don't have uh, so the resistance is not too low. But in any event, um, yeah, you so so you never you never drive the pins high; you only pull them low. So you can have ten devices pulling them low at the same time, no problem. And the, the way they go high is the pull-up resistor. You don't use 10Ks for this. You use something more like 2.5 to 4.5 kilo ohms. 2.5 to 4.5 kilo ohms. So that's pretty much what kind of the general range. Um, so uh, how many connections besides ground and VCC do you need for each device? You need two more. SDA and SCL. If the master clock set to run at 100 kilohertz, you could still connect a slower device to the bus and make it work without a data loss. Yes, because uh, the protocol allows for what's called clock stretching and the peripheral device, if it implements that, can slow the clock down so that it can keep up. How many bits in the slave's address before it's shifted left one bit? So, so kind of confusing, but, but your standard slave address is a seven bit address. And then you shift that left one bit and you append the read write bit. So it's your final slave address is an eight bit address, but only seven of the bits are the unique slave address and the other bit is the read write bit. How many bits, in, uh, sorry, can you have more than one master using the same I2C bus? Yes, you can in theory, although I, I, don't, I don't think that's done very often. On some slaves, you can change the lower three bits of the slave address, sometimes only the lower one bit, and sometimes you can change more bits than that. On your pick, you can change all the bits. You can pick your slave bit. It can be any any of the zero to 128. Although they think zero is illegal, but 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 one to 127. Uh, those are your choices. Um, and actually, I think it also implements a 10-bit slave address, or something like that, or 12-bit slave addresses. But I I had never seen those used. Um, on some slaves, you can change the lower three bits, yes. What information does the least significant bit of the eight bits sent with the memory address convey? Uh, yeah, so the least significant bit is whether you're going to read or write data from a slave. I2C is useful for connecting chips that require very fast data rates. No, if you want fast data rates, you should probably use SPI or parallel. Generally, data is sent eight bits plus the return act bit at a time. Yes, that's generally correct. And there's also start bit, start, start signals and stop signals. Okay, uh, timer modules. We use those. So timers usually have a prescaler, 8 or 16-bit counter, postscaler, and usually a period register as well. Uh, can you use a timer to count external events? Yes. Most of them are set up so that they have external pins that can essentially function as their clock. And uh, sometimes they have to have, be synchronized and uh, and if you're trying to count faster than your processor clock, it, you may have trouble. But but yes, you can you can use an external line to count events. Can usually an 8-bit timer will count shorter intervals than a 16-bit timer. Could you change this with a prescaler setting and a postscaler setting? Yes, uh, it depends on your pre and postscalers if you want to count more. But your precision is still reduced with the prescalers and postscalers. So so that um, anyway, so. Yeah, so it's true you can do that. Can a timer be used to generate interrupts? Yes, it can. Do some timers have the ability to count up or down? 
Yeah, I don't think on our. I don't think any of the timers on this pick chip can are up down counters, but uh, some of them on the KL twenty five Z are up down, and many chips do have up down counters. What is the period register typically used for? The period register holds the current count. Um, well, I don't, yeah, yeah. Can you use the prescaler to have the timer count faster than the system clock? Nope. The prescaler just slows it down. Unrelated interrupts could affect the counting of the timer module. Um, shouldn't. Timer 1 can be stopped and started by an external signal. I don't know. That's a bad question. Timer 1 can be stopped and started by an external signal. Yes, that's true. It's got a gate, and it can be stopped and started using that gate. And it, that gate can even be controlled, uh, can be directed to an external pin. So it be control, control, could be controlled by an external device, switch, or something. Instead of a, a timer module, you could use a program loop to count intervals. Why would the timer be a better choice if you had other tasks that needed doing that needed to be done during the interval. So, uh, so you if if you're using a loop, then the and you say you got an interrupt during that loop, it would definitely screw the count up. So a timer doesn't get it interrupted. It sits out there and runs, and nothing uh, causes it to, to skip skip you know skip counts. All right, I think I'm done with that. You are when you send and receive data at the same time, you're using duplex asynchronous what is the minimum number of wires so counting uh, counting ground but excluding power does it take to connect one-way communication between devices using a UART so if you're okay so if you're counting ground but not counting power you have to have a ground and then if it's only one-way communication one wire if you're doing both ways you need two wires so that would be a three a total so 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 the answer for this question would be two all right, what is meant by UART signals at TTL level? It means they're basically from ground to VDD. So ground to 3.3 or typically ground to 5 volts is really what TTLs refers to. Signals cannot, uh, let's see, the computer has a transmit pin and a receive pin, while the, UART, uh, while the UART port on the micro has the same pins. Draw a line or lines connecting. So basically, you connect the micro transmit to the desktop receive, desktop transmit to the micro receive. Can you directly connect a UART running at uh, uh, RS-232 to a standard TTL level port? No, because the RS-232 is running plus or minus 15 volts instead of zero to, say, five volts. What serial standard has mostly replaced the RS-232? USB. We often use uh, an IC like a MAX-232 to change TTL levels. Yeah, we didn't do that. It's kind of, RS-232 is kind of going away. Now we have to change levels, in some cases, between 3.3 volts and 5 volts, or 1.8 volts and 5 volts, or other, other levels. So we still have to deal with level shifters, and the and, uh, Maximum does make some chips to do that. Um, yeah, I'm not going to. Ping sensor we didn't use. Touch sensor we did use. When you, when you touch the area of a pad, you change the capacitance. Do you increase or decrease the capacitance? You increase it. So you slow the timer down. The, the 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 counter down. If you want to implement several touchpads, the method the microprocessor would use an analog multiplexer and scan each pad a few times per second. The oscillator is composed of an RC based circuit. Resistor, capacitor, and the capacitor are the pads. Touch sensing has become very common in consumer devices. Choose true or false. Touch sensing gives more precise control and uses less power. No, I, I don't know that it, it uses some power, whereas a mechanical switch uses your finger power, so it doesn't use any power. Touch sensing is less likely to break than a switch. Yes, switches are mechanical, they do break. Touch can be cheaper to make in large numbers. Yeah, uh, it depends, but if you're just, if you're doing a printed circuit board anyway, and you have room on the board for some touch panels, then they, you can do them for free. They don't cost you a thing because it doesn't cost any more to make the board with or without the touch panels. The touch pads on the Viva board added significantly to the manufacturing cost of the board. No, they did not. To get the best performance from the pad, the trace of the pad should be thin and short. There is an application note that gives guidelines on how 
to lay out touch pads on PCBs. It's recommended to have the touching finger actually make, is it, re is it recommended to have the touching finger actually make electrical contact with the copper on the board? No, absolutely not. You want a nice layer of insulating layer of paint. Can you write software to scan multiple pads in such a way to tell that two are touched at the same time? Yes, you definitely can do that. All right, we didn't use H-bridges. We did use servos. Uh, well, yes, actually we didn't. We talked about them. I Okay, there might be some. So the standard period for a servo is 20 milliseconds. With a servo of longer period, with, with a PWM signal of proper period and duty cycle, that gives a high pulse lasting 1. Millisecond, 1.5 milliseconds. About what sh position should the servo be in in general? Centered. 1.5 milliseconds is centered. One millisecond should be full left. And 2.0 should be full right out of the 20 milliseconds. So you see, you only use, you, you only use from one millisecond worth of the 20 millisecond period to determine the position of the, of the servo arm. Just pretty wasteful. And it definitely compromises your your uh, resolution because you 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 probably are just barely getting eight bits across the entire 20 milliseconds. So if you're only using one percent of the data, then then uh, then you you get you're getting uh, essentially uh, I didn't say one uh, one millisecond, which would be five percent. So you're getting five percent of say. Uh, say 256 different positions. So 5% of 256, 1% would be uh, what, 2 point, almost about 3. So you might have as many as uh, 15 different locations you can specify angles. Uh, in the picture, the, how does PWM signal get turned into a voltage? There's this pulse width to voltage converter. And that goes into the comparator the, or the air amp, the air amp takes the position sensor, and if they're the same, then then it sends no command to the motor. But if there's an error, it's going to move the motor one way or the other to reduce the error to zero. Why do servos have a gearbox? Because these motors tend to run really fast, and you want them to go down a lot slower, so you usually have a big reduction gearbox. Now, that, that also gives them a lot more torque than they would have otherwise. If your PWM module would use 100% duty cycle for the entire period, about what duty cycle would you need to center the servo? So, so if 100 if 100% duty cycle is the 20 milliseconds, then you you just need it's a 5%. So you centered it centered at five, full left at one percent. Um, no, uh, sorry, centered at 7.5%. Full left at full one way at five, full the other way at ten. Servers are limited to small DC motors. No, no, there are industrial sized servos that are, that run on three phase four forty, and they're very very powerful. Maybe you know a hundred horsepower or better. If your motor did not have a PWM module, could you use a GPIO port to generate a control signal? Yes, you you can bit bang it. SPI we didn't talk about that much. CCP we didn't really talk about that. Accelerometer, we didn't photo. Okay, photoresistor. So, use the photoresistor with GPIO is typically more reliable than using it with an A to D channel. No, you should use it with A to D because you can't really guarantee that it's going to change enough to flip the pin, um, and it may get you in between where it senses a zero and senses a one, and you're not sure what it's going to sense. Uh, when exposed to light, the resistance between the leads goes up. No, it goes down. The photoresistor is considered a passing component. Yes. Which figure, which which picture in figure two would cause the V out to increase? <clears throat> so uh, with increased light on the photoresistor. So here, as the photoresistor gets uh, less resistance with more light, it pulls the center point closer to V in. So, it, so the voltage goes up. A reasonable guess of a photoresistor value in dark is it's, it's it's a, closer to a mega ohm than anything. Photoresistors all have nearly identical resistance from the same in, on the same during the for the same light conditions. No, they they're very variable. Even the same lot numbers they vary all over the place. Photoresistors are expensive. No, they're really cheap, cheap, cheap. In Figure three to the right, the V out would go down with darkness. Well, so this is a bad example. 
because it's not going to change. Using the, assuming that your V out is sourcing very little current, it's not going to change. If 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 there's much current being drawn, then it, then it will affect it then, based on the because of the the voltage drop across here. Using a photoresistor with a GPIO port, you would likely need to address the value of R in Figure Two. Yeah, yeah. If you weren't using an A to D, you would you would probably have to play with R to get it to work correctly. Figure one is very similar to the photoresistor we used in the lab. Yes. Uh, PIR, we didn't use that. PID, we didn't do that. Four by four pad, we didn't do that. IR collision detector, buzzer, OLED, Hall effect sensor, joystick. Stepper motor. Push button. We did use the push button, and I think I'll quit with this. The push button on the Viva board is automatically debounced. No, you have to do it in software. Uh, but depending on how you do it, you may not you, you may not have a lot of trouble with it. The push button has an associated three-pin header with a jumper to select between functions reset button and a and a push button input or a reset button or push button input and RB7. Yes, that's true. This is the correct circuit below. Um, yeah, it is. The value of the resistor should be small enough to quickly pull the pin to VCC, but large enough to provide minimal problems if the pin is being used for something else, and also minimal current draw, too. How fast a user can spend, uh, send in separate inputs is primarily under software control. Yeah, that's right. Uh, be, if you're reading it infrequently, the user can't send inputs in very fast. And if, and if you read it too fast, you may count two inputs for um, one single push. <coughs> unless you have some, the, unless you're checking to make sure it, that the button's released first. Because the microprocessor is so fast, if the software is not written well, it's possible to read a thousand button pushes in less than a second. Yeah, that could happen with bouncing. Or you could just keep reading it while, it's, while the finger's still on the button. In general, if a GPIO pin on the pick does not have an ANSEL bit cleared, it will not work as an input. That's generally true, but there's some pins uh, that don't have ANSEL bits at all because they have no analog function, and RB7 is one of those pins. For this push button to work, the TRIS 7 bit must be equal to zero. No, it should be equal to a one. It should be set as an input. The mechanical switch in the push button is subject to wearing out. Yes, it is. The button is a switch described as a momentary contact normally open switch. Yes, it's normally open. All right, I think that's it. So with that, I'm going to quit. Um, and we'll do the final as written. Uh, and if you need help, I promise to do a review session at 8 p.m. Uh, tonight. Um, and I sent that out in the email. So I'll be online at 8 p.m. if you need help. And that will do it.